Hello, friends. Welcome to our Thursday night hangout here at Making an Impact. I am the foe, Cody Defoe. Right beside me, as always, the amazing natural mm. Astrid Pizarro. How are you today, Astrid? Uh, I don't know how to answer that. It's been a long day. But, and I don't know if Impact helped me too much since that, unfortunately. But we'll oh. talk about that as we go. <laughs> how are you? Uh, it's, it's been a fairly long day here as well. But uh, making it through, the, I, I didn't have any major issues with the show, I don't think. Um, looking forward to talking about it and getting ready for tomorrow night's Under Siege, which hopefully will end the, no- end the week on a high note. It will be start of the week for me. Of the weekend for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I want to say, uh, Bobby, I was listening to his interview today with uh, Joshua. So if you haven't checked that out, go on Bobby's Twitter. He, he did have a his first interview, I would say. I forgot about that detail. It was really well done. And my tag team partner from Tuesdays, Ed, how are you, Ed? Nice to have you in the chat here with us. OLED dropping in off the screen as, as we like. Um, lots to get into, lots to talk about, and to look forward to for tomorrow night. So... Uh, let's let's dive into BTI, Astrid. Um, I understand you were were pretty happy with the Death Machine being on BTI this week. Yeah, I was like, I, you know how lately it's been like one of those matches, like it's been okay. So I was not expecting much, and then as I was Callahan, I was like, you got my attention now. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I feel like the only thing is like I feel like the match was not anything like special or anything like that, like anything that I could highlight per se. But it was a Sammy Callahan match. I was entertained. I enjoyed it. And I didn't mind seeing him on a match like by himself the way he was in this particular match. Yeah, I thought it was a really fun opener. Uh, he was taking on Shogun, who we've seen a few times on. Uh, talking, uh, talking about Shogun. Barry, nice to see you drop it in. Um, you know, uh, he, he's still getting there. I think he's still fresh. He's. Uh, one of the winners of Impact kind of uh, challenge competition that they've run. I, I'm blanking right now on the name of the challenge, but um, we've seen him kind of working with Jack Price and tag teams. This is kind of one of the first opportunities we've really had to see him go it on his own. Um, personally, I feel like he's starting to grow on me a little bit. I don't know about you, Astrid. I feel like this match kind of showed mm-hmm. me a little bit more of his personality, a little bit more of mm-hmm. what he, a little bit of a flash of what he might be capable of down the road. Um, had me thinking that he could grow to be someone that maybe would replace like a Rhino or even a Willie Mack on the roster as, as that kind of impactful mm-hmm. style of competitor down the road in the future. Obviously not right away, but somewhere if he can grow and build on what he has for raw skills. At least. Yeah, I had to look it up. He was a winner of the 2020 gut check. That's what it was. Oh, I was in gotcha. British boot camp and I was like, that's the one I remember. I don't know. I couldn't remember the second one, but that's the one. Uh, no, yeah, I feel like there was more of a personality to like the character in itself this time around. I feel like I saw a little bit more this time with Sammy. So that's why I'm glad he was uh, teaming with Sammy in this match more than any of I feel like it definitely help like showcase them a little bit more than what we got before which is the most important part about this yeah that's ultimately the role that bti should be playing here is giving us an opportunity to get to know get familiar with some of these guys who don't get regular screen time your shoguns your jack prices obviously hotch and skylar work their way there sing and shira have been you know running the the bti show for quite some time now and are finally getting a little bit more main screen time throughout the main show so nice to see some other guys getting an opportunity on there now as well i feel like he's trying to be is it falaba i don't know how to read that (laughs) he's not quite the size of a falaba i think maybe he could I, i see where you're going with that barry um as kind of the funny big guy but Mm -hmm. definitely there's something there i can see why he won the gut check he's still unpolished and needs some work but hopefully that's something that getting a little bit more time with some bigger names like a callahan will give him the chance to grow and improve yeah i feel like it definitely helps to have somebody like sammy here being the, the one with the experience to like kind of got him through those type of moments of helping grow in the sense and that's why i'm glad this was the type of match to like help him grow more than anything. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we go into the main show. We get our typical recaps of some of the stuff that happened last week with the Macklin attack on PCO, uh, with the number one contenders match and the the feud budding between Eddie Edwards and Frankie Kazarian. That kind of stuff going down last week, and then we jumped into 
what I believe was probably match of the week as far as televised wrestling goes. This one, my first thought on it was it's an interesting match with Saban on his way to an X Division title match, but Speedball doing amazing at what he's doing right now felt like it was kind of a situation where you didn't want to see either one of these guys taken off, uh, taking a loss. And they didn't disappoint. It was a hell of a match. They ran for a good 15, 20 minutes, I think. They killed it. They killed the spots. They had me on the edge of my seat. It reminded me a lot of kind of a shortened version of when we got Speedball and Josh Alexander. And this is a match I would love to see again. Yeah, I just kept thinking, it's like, how could you put yourself in this pick of like how do you pick to the winner of this match? <laughs> that was my like my my first thought when I saw it. Uh, but yeah, these two, I think they was it, they absolutely killed it. I was more than anything surprised it was the opener because I expected this to be more like higher up on the card towards the end. But I don't mind it being an opener. I don't with the you know the speed and the showcasing that we got from both of them. You know, I feel like it was a good way to like get my attention right from the get go to start the show and. These two, I'm like, I, like we always joke, it's like Speedball doesn't have a gimmick. I'm just a, like he's just a good wrestler. That's what we see from him every single time on a weekly basis. Whenever he's on Impact, so it didn't disappoint in any way, shape, or form. Um, I can't even, I couldn't keep up with him to be honest. To like say, you know, anything specific that happened in the match, but um, yeah, I feel like they had great chemistry, so I, I wouldn't mind seeing this match again because it, I feel like even though I loved it, I I ended up wanting more from them. Yeah, it. I, I did take a couple extra notes. I felt like at points in this match, it kind of looked like Bailey was trying to wrestle with a little bit more of an edge to himself um, that he wasn't his typical kind of easygoing self. It really seemed like he was a little bit more gritty and a, almost like he was leaning a little bit more to trying to be on that, you know, other side of the line with Saban being the baby face going into the title match that Bailey was trying to kind of inch closer to riding that fence um, yeah. but it didn't really work because the Chicago crowd felt like they were 100% behind speedball in this one I don't recall any really loud chants getting going for Saban at all um, but ultimately um, Saban does get it done personally I feel like Chris Saban needed to channel his inner Macklin for this one and just call the match early because he put way too much out there for the night before a pay-per-view that mm -hmm. you know this is one where they'll probably look tomorrow night at being you know he put himself through a war with speedball tonight now he's got to come back in 24 hours and try and win the title mm -mm, I don't think so I think that I don't know if it was this match that actually mentioned it or if it was towards the end it's like you know, we don't realize that, you know, they have the paper view tomorrow. Like, they have kind of to slow down in a way because we don't know how it's going to affect them the next day with, with the matches. So I think this is interesting because it could kind of maybe play out to the story of, like, maybe Trey wins because Saban's like, you know, I went all out with Speedball, so I wasn't, like, 100% when I went with Trey. So it is something that could kind of play off on that end. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely something that could lead to a little bit of a longer feud here between Saban and Miguel, which I wouldn't complain about. I feel like, you know, putting those two in a match now tomorrow night, it'll probably end up being a match that contends for match of the night and one that I'd be happy to to play back again later down the line. Oh, for sure. Uh, once we got done that match, we got a, a video package from Trinity kind of recapping the last couple weeks. What did you take away from this video package, Astrid? I like more than anything the way she fires back at, at, at Giselle. She's like, you're the quintessential diva. And he's like, for me, you're like drama queen. And you're bringing like a little, like a boy to handle your business, which is uh, goes back to like, it reminds me of like what we mentioned before about the timing of how it, you know, how it took long for him to react and, you know, do the slap and the way he was holding himself for quite a bit before he actually did it. And even like the promo itself, like, like I've, I feel like his mic work was not great during this. I, I mean, not that it, he had a lot to work with because there's not much for him to say in, to begin with, but I feel like he could have done better in this part of it. Um, but yeah, I just, I just love seeing this so far. Um, looking forward to it. Made me excited thinking of like, how we have his in Giselle wrestling in you know quite a few weeks. So that would be interesting to see how it plays off on screen versus Trinity has been a little bit more active now since she, she returned. Yeah. She also kind of touched a lot on how she came back. She was just happy to get back in the ring and to, to get out there and, you know, explain herself. Didn't expect to be interrupted in her talk, but 
got interrupted mm-hmm. by both Diana and Jordan and kind of thrown right mm-hmm. into the fire. Jumped in, got her first match against Kylan, and now gets her first, um, you know, premier live event with Giselle Shaw. She really, you know, that first show kind of felt slow. It felt like, you know, I'm here. I'm just going to tell you why it took me a year to show up, why I chose Impact, what what my plans are now that I'm here. And then, bang, all of a sudden the switch turned Mm. and it's just people coming at her from all angles. You know, you don't just walk in and get a title shot. People are going to start coming Mm. and gunning for you as soon as you walked in that door and declared your shot. Yeah, and I I love seeing how we already have something going on with her and we don't know if she's going to go to the title match right away after this few witches out or is she going to go towards somebody else and work her way up the way kind of like we got with Mickey James before. So I think it'll be interesting to see after... Under Siege is over, which direction they take her on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we got a commercial break, and then we got another video package, this time from the world champion, Steve Macklin. Um, kind of a package showing the last couple weeks in the lead-up and the PCO beatdown from last week. And then we get Steve kind of on camera talking about how everything in this video package, it's just to this point has been wasted motion that it proves that PCO isn't qualified to be his, his opponent and won't be his opponent at tomorrow's in, under siege. He's going to head to the ring later tonight to declare who his challenger for tomorrow night will be. It was a, a neat way to play this off the, you know, the attack and the beat down and the assault last week, Macklin should know better that he didn't, he didn't double tap last week. So he should have <laughs> known better than to assume the monster was dead, but this is a typical horror story, right? The villain yeah. always comes back in the end. Yeah, I was like, you gotta, you know, hit them at the head. If not, they always come back somehow. Um, I love that part of like he thinks just like I feel like I kept thinking, you think that little beat down PCO is gonna do something to him? <laughs> Good luck with that one. Then um, I thought it was just funny when you think about it from his aspect. It's like he thought that was it. No. I, I- I watched Jonah put PCO through like four tsunamis to the point that he was coughing up blood and he still came back the next week. You think just Mm -hmm. taking him out backstage is going to do something? Mm -mm. I don't think so. Uh, We got our next in-ring action with a tag team match. We have Kenny King, K-I-N-G, taking on, well, teaming with Sheldon Jean to take on the Decay. Mm -hmm. A uh, little bit of a surprise at the start here that the national treasure, Nick Aldis, decides to make his way down, joining commentary for the match. Pretty standard tag team match here, I think. I had to, sorry, Ed. Macklin's first play favorite challenge is PCO. Still can't believe that. Yeah, neither can I. <laughs> it's got to take out a Canadian. I guess. Um, pretty standard tag match between Kenny King and... Um, Sheldon Jean versus the Decay here. Nothing really jumped off the page. Commentary spent a lot of time just talking about Nick Aldis and his feud with Kenny King. Um, the one thing that did kind of jump out to me is Aldis talking about. Actually, I think this was after the match when they had a little bit of a, mm-hmm. a back and forth on the mic. Kenny talking about how Aldis has to work his way up to the King, and Nick Aldis is like, "No, no. If anything, you need to work your way up to the National Treasure." I already took out your lackey last week. Now I'm going to, you know, slowly and dramatically unbutton my jacket and come in there and show you both. Um, I like how he kind of teased the, the slow and dramatic yeah, unbuttoning, calling that out. Um, but the match itself, I mean, Decay is always a good hand in the ring. They always put on, you know, entertaining stuff. But it really just felt like this was the setup to kind of get us hyped for the official showdown between King and Aldous. As 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 K I N G, I love seeing Kenny King on my computer screen. <laughs> um, yeah, what I thought about this is just more than anything. You, I thought at first it was a one on one match, and Sheldon was just accompanying Kenny to the ring. And when they announced that they're teaming, I was like, I like this because it just sort of that story of like him being that protege uh, to Kenny now. And it'll be interesting to like. I feel like finally now he has some kind of direction with somebody in here in Impact, which I like. I just want to see like how it goes further on. But it just made me think of like at least we'll get a sort of something that's like actually like a good foundation for Kenny King to be here on a weekly basis, and to have Sheldon like show on screen some kind of growth as he's actually te- you know teaming and learning from Kenny King. I think it, it, you know both storylines going on at the same time is interesting to watch as well. So that's why I'm, I'm glad this is more than anything what I got from this match. 
Yeah, I did enjoy commentary too, just kind of talking that part of it up that like, what is Kenny King's angle with Sheldon Jean? Is he actually trying to take him under his wing? Is he just using him as like cannon fodder? Is he someone that's just there to be in his corner and take a beating on his behalf? Or is is King actually doing the honorable thing and taking a kid to, to higher higher heights? Gotta wait and see. Yeah. Um uh, I'll get my notes back up here. Um we went backstage to Jessica still standing at the door, still watching her hour. Waiting too long. <laughs> like sends through an hourglass. Um the the sand is almost out. It's been going for like three weeks now, but it's almost yeah. out. But she can't stay long enough to wait for it to finish because she needs to get to the ring for her match against Taylor Wilde coming up next. Uh which Astrid, I want I want to hear it from you. <laughs> <laughs> this, this match. Uh, I expect you were not a fan of this match. What match? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no the only thing I I will defend Impact with with this match and the one we got later on, though. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, Sands <laughs> through the hourglass. He said the days of our lives got a lot of trash American softball. Trademarks, <laughs> Ed. Trademarks. That's why I stopped myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it, taking it th- three weeks for that. Oh, jeez. But um, no, I, you know, I, I'm usually the one that always says, you know, I prefer my knockouts matches and my women's matches and as and overall to have decent time. I don't like this like five minute matches or less. Uh, the only thing I would defend impact with is that both of the matches that we got tonight for the knockouts made sense for them ending the way they did and how quickly they went. I just would have preferred if it had been one last week and one this week rather than two short matches in one episode because it feels like we barely got anything from the knockouts you know in ring action so i would defend them like i understand for example storyline wise with this match jessica is not concentrated she's still wondering about rosemary do i go in do i let her you know i wait for her you know the hourglass is running out so she's not concentrated you can see even by her entrance like her you know she's her mind is not in the in the, in the place for the match itself so it doesn't make sense for her to lose as quickly as she did i just i would, did not expect it and i saw like the pin in the one, two, three, and I was like, wait, what happened? I had to go back and rewind a couple of seconds to realize that the match had ended that quickly. But yeah, I, I think it, it made sense for the storyline. I just I'm disappointed it had to happen in that short of a match, though. Um, but yeah, overall I it makes sense to me and I understand why it happened. Yeah, ultimately yeah. it was it was storyline development. I agree with you there. It it definitely sucks to have it be as short as it did, but it really advanced the story. And it wasn't entirely a short segment. It was short from bell to bell, but it did play out longer. Um, Obviously, Jessica takes the loss here. She comes out easily distracted already. Her mind's still in the back on what's going on with Rosemary. She quickly gets distracted by Kylan King, which allows Taylor to take advantage. Hit her witch's brew, which is whatever she's calling it, the, the finishing move. And a quick pin... But during the post-match beatdown, while Kylan and Taylor are double-teaming Jessica, we cut to the back where the hourglass is officially run out. The door opens. We see a pair of bright blue Converse Chuck Taylor sneakers come through the door, (laughs) click their heels, and take off. And then the music hits, and we get Courtney Rush running down, rushing down, if you will, to make the save for Jessica Chase the coven away. Um, clearly, this this is Rosemary, but it's it's not. Um, even Jessica's confused at first, and I, I like how Courtney kind of takes that look at her and is like, "Look, look at my eyes. Look into my eyes." <laughs> yeah. This, we didn't see uh, this coming at all, Astrid. We, yeah. we were convinced Jessica was going to become Havoc yeah. again. We did not at all have we, anything. We didn't think about of, it the other way around, though. <laughs> yeah, of, of Rosemary becoming something more like Jessica yeah. as opposed to Jessica returning to be like Rosemary. Rosemary's been Rosemary for seven years now. It's it's nice mm. to see a change for her character-wise, but it definitely took me by surprise. As soon as the Converse came out, I knew or I had a pretty solid idea what had just transpired before mm-hmm. she even the music hit and came down to the ring, but it still took me by surprise to see the way this mm-hmm. story played out in the end. 
Yeah, and another thing I wanted to point out too, I I will always say I'm glad it, the Taylor Wilde match was a short match too because it's a Taylor <laughs> Wilde match. That's another aspect to it, but that's a different story. Uh, but no, I had never seen uh, Rosemary as in her corny. So when the shoes, when I saw the shoes, I was like, I wonder who this is. I wonder what happened, like what kind of transformation we got, um, and just seeing it play out the way they did. Um, I I was just mostly surprised. Um, I love like showing them like that connection of like you know it's still me kind of her thing so um i overall i th i enjoyed it i i like how they kind of give us that connection between both of them and um even backstage when she's like oh, i'm not supposed to be here is she supposed to be here like what happened and like the back and forth they have with each other and even she's like do you want to be at death all and i was like i mean i, I guess it was like how, if she says no what happens then <laughs> but um uh, I, she's like yeah sure and I was like oh okay this is interesting now but I had never seen her like this so I, I am like excited to see how it is on screen with her and Jessica for the next match I'm just like more than anything like excited and, like for what happens moving forward between them because I like you said it was nothing that I expected I took the more like you know that Jessica change I just like I did not expect this kind of change to be honest yeah, um, for those that don't know, Courtney Rush is actually a past character of Rosemary's. Um, she was Courtney Rush in her time in Shimmer and before coming to Impact. Um, so obviously this is her kind of coming full circle mm -hmm. back to who she was. I love how they kind of explained it in character and in story where mm -hmm. Jessica's confused on who Courtney is and if she's Rosemary. And Courtney basically says, you know, I... I am Rosemary, or at least Rosemary's been kind of possessing my body for the last seven years and basically just kind of rounds it up as mutual possession and such. Um, and like you said, she's not sure why she's here since Rosemary's supposed to be here, but since she is, it means there's an adventure to go on. Which, Bilbo Baggins, anyone? We're going on an adventure. Jeez. Yeah, I'm just excited though. I feel like it's something like you said, I, I did not predict it or expect it in any way, shape, or form. So I'm I'm just I'm just I to open to the idea of like what happens next between them and this storyline. Um and to see how like I said, I'm used to seeing Rosemary, so I think it'll be interesting for me to see Courtney Rush on screen and how different she is from the Rosemary character. Like I'm excited to see the differences and you know how well she does, you know, with the character in itself. Yeah. Uh, kind of wish this had happened a month ago and that I would have actually got to see her as Courtney Rush in person as opposed to Rosemary, but uh, really cool, I guess, that I got to see Rosemary in kind of one of her last appearances as the character for, yeah. for the time being. Um, excited to see where it goes, excited to see how, how she plays this character with Jessica. Um, and as we got confirmed later in the night, we get um, the Death Dolls, the new Death Dolls, are going to get to come around full circle and take on the Coven for the Knockouts Tag Titles at Tomorrow Night's Under Siege. So we'll get to our predictions on that a little later when we get into our predictions. But um, this story has kind of made its round now, at least. Yeah. We go back to the ring after we have that, and we have Angels taking on rich swan um in kind of a tease of tomorrow night's design versus callahan swan and a person um a fun another fun x division match here this one didn't mm -hmm. get the time that speedball and saban got but it still was a lot of fun to see these guys that i believe it was a first time matchup if i recall correctly them talking about that yeah, that I, so. I don't think angels and swan have ever met before and really, it was, again, just a setup for tomorrow's, mm -hmm. but they still put a lot into it. They still built the story into it. You had Callahan at ringside along with Diener and Khan. So a lot of the shenanigans going on out there. Um, Angels has Swan in a position for the win. Diener yelling at him to finish him, finish him. And Angels can't get the job done. And Swan manages to complete it with the 450. But then you have the design come in, beat down Swan. Sammy tries to make the save with the bat. Ultimately, the numbers are still too much, and we leave on Swan and Callahan beat down and the three design members standing tall, and the lingering question of who is a person. Yeah, I really, this match is one that, like, earlier, I feel like there was something that really, like, stood out to me, but it just, you can see the numbers play off in here with the distraction and the beatdown towards the end as well. 
and like leaving you with that question was like who is going to be that person i really thought they were going to have that person like come out and end up helping callahan and swan to like end up like a high note of like oh this is who it is surprise um I just didn't expect to like not get any sort of reveal, which I thought was interesting because I for the go home show, you can expect that person to be revealed at least in that segment or in some way, shape or form. But I the only thing I'm I don't know if I'm excited or or like scared of like, I don't know who it is. I don't know who it could be either. So that's the part that I'm wondering how it'll play off uh, with the teams. But um, yeah, I feel like the match itself was it wasn't a bad match. I just had nothing else that like really like stood out or that I could highlight. But I I liked having Swan win it more than anything, but I just I wonder how that will play off too, or is the the match uh, tomorrow? I will say that I'm happy that they didn't choose to do the reveal tonight. Um, I've been kind of a, a knock on impact for a little while about that. How a lot of the time this stuff gets leaked early, whether it's mm -hmm. because of tapings and people get it out into the new into the information, or they just decide to. Um, have it happen on the taping so that the surprise isn't really a surprise. Mm -hmm. Hopefully nothing comes out in the next 24 hours before we get to Under Siege, <laughs> leaking whoever is the surprise that's going to be at the show. Maybe it's somebody already on the, or on the roster that won't be as noticeable if they show up at the arena that somebody can pinpoint and be like, oh, this person's in London tonight. We know who it's going to be. Hopefully it's either kept a secret in one way or the other or it's somebody from the roster who we're just not thinking of. But I, I love the aspect of the surprise. I've always been a believer that a surprise is so much better when you don't know it's coming. Um, and, and as much as we live in a world of, you know, leaks and like easily accessible information and that it, it almost makes it feel even bigger when a leak and in the information like this doesn't make it out before the show itself. It makes you want to tune in to find out who it is. It makes you want to buy the pay-per-view tomorrow night to be like, oh my God, who could it be? Could it be somebody from OVE? Could it be somebody that you and I mentioned last week? Mm -hmm. Could it be a big name coming from another company that maybe is mm -hmm. just on, on loan or somebody whose contract ran out somewhere else that is coming to make make a statement in an impact size company? Make, make an impact? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just I'm mostly just like surprised that we didn't get the review because you cannot most of the time when you have shows like this, especially when it's a, that go home show, you expect that surprise to be revealed. I was mostly surprised it didn't happen. I was wait, expecting that run in for the save, and I was just surprised it didn't happen. I was like, oh, they're really keeping it on the wraps. Interesting. I, I hope no? it means it's something big. I really do. I hope it means yeah. it's something big that's really going to make us happy tomorrow to see it happen. <laughs> Very. The person will likely be a massive disappointment, but it's in fact used to that. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> a moment of silence for that. Comment. I mean, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, whatever it is tomorrow, it's something. Great. Something. <laughs> uh, we get a backstage interview with Gia Miller and Deanna, similar to Gia's interview with Jordan from last week. This time, you know, asking how Deanna's doing, how she feels about the situation and getting taken out by Jordan in their tag match a couple weeks ago. Jordan says, you know, I saw the footage. I'm giving Jordan the benefit of the doubt. It seemed like it was, you know, an honest mistake. It was an accident. I don't think she did it on purpose. And for whatever reason, Alicia Edwards is just standing by for Gia Miller's interviews right now and swings her face in mm -hmm. and starts stirring the pot. You know, mm -hmm. how, how do you how do you know that you can give her the benefit of the doubt? I think there's more going on here than you expect. Eddie's been saying it for years that there's people back here who are all backstabbers. Mm -hmm. Why is Alicia here? I'm, I'm still trying to figure that one out. And... <laughs> More than yeah. anything, Alicia's presence here makes me question, can Jordan and Deanna not tell this story themselves? They need Alicia here to stir up some drama in their story because they're not capable of doing... Like, this Jordan and Deanna story coming out of Rebellion leading up to Under Siege, they've mm -hmm. had Alicia tied up in it, they've had the Coven tied up in it, they mm -hmm. had to interrupt the Trinity segment to build to their story... Why are they not able to just build this story themselves? Why do they have mm -hmm. to have everybody else tied up in their story? <laughs> you know, to go very, I swear the TV at that point. <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, when she came on screen, I just kept thinking, 
why? Why are you here, first of all? It's like, first he did it with Jordan, now with Deanna. Again, why? Because we know Alicia's not going to go towards the title anytime soon. Probably never anyway. But so I'm like, why are you really here? And like you said, I keep thinking of like, we have so many people, like so many like layers to this that I feel we barely had an interaction between Jordan and Deanna, just them. Because whenever we get something, like you said, the coming came up and then we had the Trinity interruption. So we never really had them. The only time we really had them like alone was in the tag team match. And then I feel like that was like short lived because the match itself doesn't last too long. So I feel like we never had them like really go back and forth with each other one on one, whether it's on the mic or like a backstage interview, even just like a preview of the match somehow. The only one we got was that, you know, them teaming. And that's it. It was like, I wondered why it had to be like, instead of going back and forth between Deanna and Jordan, they have to go back and forth with Trinity. It's like, Trinity is not going to get, I know we're teasing this, but Trinity is probably not going to get involved into after the Giselle feud or probably who knows it, maybe sometime after that. So it's probably not, you don't know if it's going to happen anytime soon. But, and then we get the storyline of like, oh, the, the Deanna injuries. So it's like, okay, so why is this happening now? Why are you trying to do that when we have, this is the last show before the pay-per-view. I, I was very confused about that aspect. And I honestly forgot that Alicia and Jordan was happening. So when I see Alicia in her gear, I was like, who are you wrestling tonight? Because I'm afraid now. I mean, hopefully you didn't blink a little bit later. You might have missed it. I I think I did almost. I had to rewind it too. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, it uh, didn't help. (laughs) Interestingly, coming out of the next commercial break, we come back from commercial and immediately are running backstage and find Masha... Slamovich and Killer Kelly brawling it out through the arena kitchen. Um, we haven't really heard anything from either of these women since their match a couple weeks ago. And now here they are beating each other down through the kitchen, throwing each other around the building, ultimately ending up with Slamovich choking out Kelly using an electrical cord that she finds on the ground near an emergency exit. Um, it felt a little anticlimactic with the choke out at the end. I kind of hoped it was a pull apart brawl where, you know, one of them would mm-hmm. get dragged away or hauled off or, you know, something like that. It, it was, it was something, it continues the story. It just felt like it was a little lacking in what I would have liked to have seen. All I can say after seeing this and after seeing that match a couple weeks ago, please tell me this leads to a monster's ball. <laughs> Uh, this is Ed. I'm always glad when Alicia's uh, when I miss Alicia on my TV. Well, I'm I was hoping I would miss her, but I didn't. And then this is very true though. The kitchen isn't as dangerous as the NXT parking lot, but it works. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is one that I just I kind of expected some kind of graphic going. Oh, it's got the more kind of a fruit this match, and we're gonna get them next week, something like that, to like tell me like this is something that we'll get a continuation towards i would not mind a monsters but i feel like that would be pretty cool to have between the ladies though that's not a bad idea and they're going to bury ed how dare you alicia's my favorite uh of who not mine i don't think it's cody's either so i hope it's not you barry because i will judge you on that one <laughs> <laughs> i feel like barry's being a little bit mm. he's being a little sassy yeah um yeah no uh i think these two Having them in the hardcore war with the Bully and Dreamer match, having them mm-hmm. in their match, having them in the brawl now. I think the natural progression for this is something that leads to a Monsters Ball. I think these two ladies are built for the situation of a Monsters Ball. They both love the carnage, the violence. <laughs> it, fulfilling pain. They both love dealing out pain and dealing mm-hmm. it to each other. And I think this is something that just feels right. <laughs> Trust me, I had to watch much too much Alicia. I didn't defend the shows. <laughs> I I do not envy you on that end, Ed. I'll let you know right now. So there it is. Uh speaking of apparently Barry's favorite Alicia. Or or at least she's trying to be in action. Ultimately, she just gets toyed with a little bit, takes a grace driver, and is finished even faster than wild beat. I, I did wonder which one was faster, though, because I, I, I'm i curious about that end of it. So I know KH match is not 100%, but I'll probably be checking there just so I can compare them. Um, but again, I, this is another one that I was not mad of, like, how short the match was, because it makes sense with the storyline. We don't get Alicia in the ring often. 
you know, we have Jordan with the match coming up, so it makes sense for Jordan to win it, you know, and win it as fast as she did. I, I'm not mad at it, to be honest. Um, and again, Alicia's one of those, I the least amount of matches I see her in, the better it is. So it was like giving me a short match with Alicia and it works out. Um, again, it just feels like it makes sense for the storyline. I get why it was a short match. And just like I said oh, earlier, overall, I just felt disappointed that the two you know, knockouts matches that we got tonight were too short. And that's all we got from the ladies tonight in that aspect. Yeah, it was two short matches. Ultimately, it was storyline progression. We got the backstage segment with Diana. We got the video package for Trinity. We got the backstage segment with Masha and Kelly. So it at least had a fair contingent of women on the show. And I guess the one silver lining we have to look forward to is we get three women's matches on the pay-per-view tomorrow night. Yeah. Uh, why, Dango, why? That's where we went next. This was this was a really well done, interesting mm-hmm. cut of Dango explaining his actions, I felt. Um, I, I'm just going to lead off and say that I really, really enjoyed this. I enjoyed this angle of Dango. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it felt like there was enough of Dango's kind of comedy and humor just kind of leaking through in the edits and the cuts that they did between takes. Um where you could still see he was Dango and he was doing this, like cutting Mm -hmm. a serious promo, even though he still is the same Dango. He had some great lines in here though. He talked about how he grew up in the attitude era and it feels like everyone in that dressing room now is living in the gratitude era. He says, they're just happy to take pictures with their opponent after the match. The boys in the back are now more concerned about social media likes than the live crowd reaction. This all hit really hard because it feels Mm -hmm. accurate. Um, It it feels like, I don't know if Dango is the right person to be in the position to tell this story, Mm -hmm. but I love the fact that they're going with this character and with this angle with him. I feel like this is a a huge positive for Dango as a person, as a performer, as a wrestler Mm -hmm. to get to take a serious turn here. Um, They asked him about attacking Santino, Um, all I picked up and caught from that was when he was in the ring with Santino and he pulled out the Cobra and it was so 2010. Uh, and then he talks about Henry and he thinks it's a mockery that Henry has a toy belt and he's going to make a mockery of him and take it from him. Yeah, I feel like most, most, more than what I felt with him, it just, I feel like this would have made more sense from somebody a little bit older than Dango, if that makes sense. Somebody that didn't really grow up in a social media kind of world. I feel with Dango, he's one of those people like he fed off of social media with the you know with the dance and everything in WWE. So I feel like in that end, I feel like would have made more sense. But like you said, I I do agree. And I I liked how he delivered his lines on this and how he sounded like the character sounded more than anything of like oh be more concerned with the social media, which and if you think about it, connects back to Joe Henry being the digital media champion and. Thinking, can you imagine the guy that doesn't like social media being the di- digital media champion? Like that would be like ironic. So I feel like if you think about it, like that's the connection that I made with it. Um, and I like the part of like, oh, I attacked him because it's 2020, 2010 and he's playing the same character all over again. And Joe is a stooge. And like all these answers were like really well done. It wasn't like it was something that makes sense story like was. And I was like, not bad. And I was like, and I, I like the production about it of like having the like the you know the you know, the titles, like, why Dango, why? And, like, the little, like, kind of, like, chapters to it, basically. They yeah. titled it before he continued to talk. And I like how it was divided in the video package there. But, yeah, I feel like it just made it make sense for somebody, like, a little bit older that wasn't living or doesn't like social media versus somebody, like, with Dango that, you know, has been in social media before. Um, and like you said, that part of what he says, like, oh, the guys now are just, like, more than anything, checking about, you know, their social media and their likes, and that's their concern now. And then that isn't the concern that, you know, the wrestlers had before. But overall, just, like, I feel like this alone just sold me on the match, thinking, can you imagine Dango not liking social media, but being the, being the digital media champion? What? <laughs> you know, it's just yeah, one of those, like, true. that's what I thought about. So um, I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, I want to see some kind of, you know, video packages like this moving forward from him. Um, if he, if his character decides to keep going in this way with the storyline, um, 
And as Barry says here, uh, plenty of wrestlers try this type of character, and it's slightly embarrassing to watch. But Dango made it for real. Um, yeah, I feel like, and I feel like more genuine coming from him. That's how, like the vibe that I got from his comments. Uh, Dango has always in his t-shirts. How much bitter and angry can you get? Damn it! <laughs> I don't mind yeah. me there. I, I will say for Dango, like he's older than you are. He's yep. he's reaching that cusp. He's like an elder millennial at this point, kind of borderline almost to the Gen X. So it does work for him, like, age-wise. Mm -hmm. I think what makes it a little bit harder for to get fully behind it is, like you said, the fact that as Fandango, as Breezango with Tyler Breeze, he really kind of made his career on the social media and like, the YouTube skits and the, the uh, fashion files and mm -hmm. stuff like that, that coming back around... You can almost, I guess, take it that he did that stuff it's because it's what he needed to do. Mm -hmm. But now he's kind of older and more bitter and angry at the fact, you know, I had to play something that I grew up watching the Attitude Era and I had to play into this social media era. And now I'm watching everybody else just being happy with their social media likes and not a crowd reaction. And I want the crowd reaction. I came into this. He's like, if I was a 15 year old now, I never would have like never would have wanted to become a wrestler. And I feel like that's relatable as a wrestling fan and being a wrestling fan for as long as I've been. And I'm sure you can kind of feel the same way having been fans for most of our lives. If we were watching nowadays, wrestling isn't considered as cool with, with students in school and stuff anymore. It's really hard to find the wrestling communities in different towns around the world. I feel like that's something that I struggle with more than anything growing up because it was more like why are you a girl like in wrestling that was always the first thing and the second thing was always like wrestling is fake versus now even though people do say it i feel like they, they do bring it up but like the fact that you end up meeting people that do like wrestling and that happened to be at work not too long ago i have one of the like new managers that came in probably like less than a month ago and i don't know how he came into the office and all he says like yeah i was staying up watching wrestling and i was like here comes another one. And I had like let people here and there that I told them about it um, and like doing what I do here, you know, in, in, for wrestling media. And most of them have like think, oh, that's cool. Like it's, I don't get like mocked in any way for doing it. So I think it's interesting because it, when I was younger, I would have made, made fun of for actually liking wrestling, just liking it and not doing anything else uh, about it. Um, but I thought also was interesting with like the points of like he mentioned not only the social media, but the crowd reaction, because if you think about it, that's Joe Henry. He gets the crowd reaction and he's the one in social media, like the digital media champion. So I thought it was interesting that those points do go back to Joe Henry and Joe Henry's character as a whole and impact since he has arrived. But yeah, overall, I, I enjoy this a lot. I hope we get something like this moving forward for Nango. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the match tomorrow there as well. Uh, we got a quick video package just kind of setting up for the number one contenders match after the tag match last week. We didn't really get to see or talk to or hear from anybody else in that match. Everybody got a quick look, excuse me, a quick one liner um, in this video package, just telling their story. Moose, you know, as the most respected world champion last year, Eddie talking about where he's come from and how he wants to get there. Kaz talking about how he came back and wants to be a champion Alex Shelley talking about how he's never been world champion and wants to win it. Yuya talking about wanting to, you know, make the Impact World Championship more worldwide and more internationally known. There's lots of different storylines coming out of this, but nothing really that jumped off the page as noteworthy, per se. Nope, nothing. Uh, we get the setup for um, Skyler versus Chris Bay. Um, good hands not getting an entrance this week was kind of a tip off as to how this match was going to go. I think, uh, Brian Myers out there again with his learning tree 2.0, um, trying to give them advice and guide them through the only real thing I have about this match was just how, how they set up the ending that it felt like Myers found a winning strategy last week and they tried to go yeah. back to it again this week and yeah. it, it fumbled. Um, we get Skyler kind of getting beat down a little bit by Chris Bay. Hotch this week jumps up on the apron to try and distract the ref. They try to go to the same play of pushing Bay into the side of the ropes where Myers is. 
but Bay is ready for it and takes out Myers before Myers can hit him. Lands the art of finesse and gets the pinfall. It, it was quick. It was nothing spectacular, but it it felt like there's a story to tell there. That Myers, you know, he's trying to teach these kids how to be something better, but he doesn't have really that history of success mm-hmm. too much himself. So he found something that worked, and then he tried to go back to the well a second time, and Ace and Bay are too smart from that. They learned from last week and were prepared for it. Yeah, and I like that they brought it up. I think it was after the match, if I'm not mistaken, um, of like Matt said, you know, the fool me one, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me uh, kind of line. And, it's like, and he did point that out during the match. He's like, oh, it looks like whatever they thought worked last week, they were going to try it this week and it didn't work out. So, he, and then uh, Tom told him, you can, you know, uh, they didn't get fooled again. You can think about that part of it. Um, so I like how Myers makes it look like he has like a recipe for success, a recipe, you know, to get all these victories for the team. And just when he thinks he has it and he tries it, it doesn't work the second time around. So it's like, now you got to go back to the drawing board and like think back of like, what would be our next move? Uh, cause it felt like it works for a bit with the distraction that they had, um, then distracting Bay and Austin there, but it just, it didn't work out at the end when it came to the victory though. I feel like it was short lived. So I like that point of like, we kind of had to find our way as a team with Myers because, you know, I helped last week, but it's not going to help all the time. So we got to find like a new strategy uh, moving forward. And I just, you know, they're the champions. So I was not expecting Bay to lose this match either when it, when it was scheduled. So sorry, that's all I had in my mind when it crossed. I was like, yeah, definitely not losing this match. Um, yeah, that, that was it, other than the main event segment. Um, I'm going to hold off on that main event segment for the time being. We're going to go through our predictions for tomorrow night's show first, um, and then we'll save the world title picture for after we go through the main event. So let's let's start right off the top here. On the countdown to Under Siege, we get the Knockouts Tag Team title match between Courtney Rush and Jessica taking on the coven of taylor wilde and kylan king astrid where are you falling on this one do we have the coven retaining or do the newly formed death dolls uh take the title uh it just this reminds me of the joke that my brother makes of like whenever you have like a new character or whenever you are like a debut quote-unquote as we have with our Cordy rush here you end up winning a championship. So I wonder if that's something that's going to happen here because I feel like that will make the storyline super interesting because I feel like when it was Rosemary, they mostly lost after that thoughts when it was like Rosemary uh, teaming up with Jessica or with Taya. So I think it'll be interesting with Courtney, we get them winning more often. So I would like to see them winning. And at first, I, I will prefer them winning so that way we can have them and the Coven going back and forth with the title of like that battle there because I don't like having the Coven in power for too long i hope that makes sense yeah um the whole story here seems like it's built up to you know courtney rush coming back in this character um we went full circle with the death dolls losing losing to the coven having to work through all the supernatural magic and coming back to it um it it definitely feels like we're going that route so i agree with you there i do feel like the new death dolls will be taking the titles tomorrow night Mm -hmm. And Corey, thank you for stopping by. Hey, guys, listening as I write some world building and character building notes. Hope all is well. If you haven't checked out, Corey writes some really wonderful pieces. So I would check out his Twitter because I know he writes for a bunch of places. I'm not going to remember all of them. I know Body Slam is one of them. So you can correct me if I'm wrong, Corey. Um, and Barry here, I predict some sound, uh, some, uh, sound issues shows. Uh, show starting slightly late and a disappointing surprise for tomorrow <laughs> but why does it have to be all negative barry come on it's the start of wrestling week and we have a lot going on let's start with a high note please <laughs> yeah i agree with astrid on this one we're gonna start on a high note we're gonna come out we're gonna have a great opening beat uh, countdown show and we're gonna have a fantastic under siege there we go that said second match on the countdown show is our digital media championship match between 30 dango and Joe Hendry, and I'm very torn on this one, Astrid. I'm very, very (laughs) torn on this one. Um, I love what Dango's done. I called the heel turn for him well before it happened, but I've always been a supporter of our digital media champion. I I have to stay firm on this one. I believe in Joe Hendry. 
I, I feel the same way because I just keep thinking I this video package that we got from Dango tonight, I it really sold me on this match. Like I said earlier, it just made me think of like that guy that doesn't like social media being digital media champion. So so ironic that I like the idea of it. But I'm like, I don't want Joe to lose it. <laughs> um, so I, I'm really torn. But, you know, being that he put that championship on my shoulder, I'm going to go with the champion, keep it on Joe Henry. So, And the championship is real, Dango. I held it in my hands here. <laughs> uh, first match that we have for the main card, um, Giselle Shaw with potentially Savannah and Jay Vidal in her corner taking on the newly signed, debuted Trinity. Astrid, where, where are you feeling this one goes? I was going to say, we're going to do it. One, two, three. Trinity. <laughs> Come on, we're supposed to do it at once. Come on. Uh, I, I no. Can't against, no, I can't go no. against Trinity. It's, it's too soon. Um, <laughs> as much as I feel like Giselle's been building momentum and shouldn't be taking a loss here, I think I just, I have to have to go with you there that trinity is it would be crazy for her to lose this match this early in her mm -hmm. career especially after already setting up potential programs with diana and jordan along the line yeah definitely true so we're we're three for three so far we're on the same page all the way down the line <laughs> let's see if we fall there on the next one astrid kenny king mm -hmm. versus nick aldis oh, oh my word uh this is what i um, I don't want to say I'm torn. I just, I feel like I could go either way. That's the kind of match, if, that's what it feels like for me. Uh, I really don't know. I just like, I feel like I would like Kenny to win to kind of keep going with how he's going, you know, that foundation that we have with him so far, that stability. But it's like, all oh, this is, you know, the first time we see him on pay-per-view like this in quite a while. So it's like, I don't want him to lose right from the get-go. Uh, I'm going to pick Aldis, you know. I see this match going one of two ways. And I think Sheldon Jean plays a factor either way. Mm -hmm. um, either Sheldon Jean helps Kenny King win or Sheldon Jean attempts to help Kenny King win and ultimately ends up being the reason Kenny loses. Um, and I think I'm going to go with the latter on this. I'm going to say that Sheldon Jean tries to help and either fails or gets caught or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But I'm with you. I think Nick Aldis, you know, already having set up a, a future program with Steve Macklin, I don't foresee him losing his first mm -hmm. major match on, on Impact either. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we got the design taking on Sammy Callahan, Rich Swan, and as the graphic says, a partner. We still don't know who the partner is. We don't have any hints, any leaks, any info to the best of our knowledge as to who the partner is. I don't know that I can vote against a mystery partner. having <laughs> The power of the mystery partner. <laughs> having a debut and not winning in this situation. Mm -hmm. I still feel like I want Diener to be on to bigger and better things. I feel like this has to be the end of this design and Sammy Callahan's story. Um, I, I, I'm I'm torn on it, Astrid. I really am. I, I'm gonna go with the design, though. Oof. This one is also one that I feel like it could go either way. The only thing I was thinking about it. Let me see if I'm correct or not. I don't think I had it. Yeah. So the only thing I was thinking about that could be it because I've only seen him once recently has been that maybe the the partner is as we call them a Fulton or Madman Fulton. That's the person that I could think about being perhaps the um the partner. And I feel like that would be cool to see. But I don't know who I would pick as a winner. I'm like it could be like either one. Uh, but I feel like it will make more sense for like to keep going with the Sammy story like for Sammy to win and have you know I said you know I pick my partners and we ended up beating the design and getting rid of them. And I want to see what the design does to rebuild after this. Cause I think that storyline will be interesting to see. All right. We're going to get into the rest of the title matches and the, the main uh, matches down the line here. Now, next up the tag team title match between ABC, the Ace and Bay club 
taking on subculture of Flash Morgan Webster, Mark Andrews with Danny Luna in their corner. Astrid, you have a little bit more knowledge of subculture than I do from the time you've spent covering NXT. Um, how how do you feel about this? Do we think it's it's ABC's time? No, even with that, I, I don't get me wrong. I know the match is going to be great, and um, it's going to have it's going to be like a great showcase. But I don't see ABC losing, especially with the, like somebody coming in and kind of like a guest, not somebody that's really going to be staying in the roster. So I definitely don't see. I don't see them losing this. Yeah, I think we're in agreement there. Um, I I remember seeing a little bit of Flash Morgan Webster and Mark Andrews in the inaugural U, uh, NXT UK Championship tournament, but um, as good as they are as performers, I don't think Ace and Bay are losing those titles anytime <laughs> soon. Uh, and if you haven't yet, as Ed is saying, it's the guy that won the British book came over Alpha Fire and Ram- Rampage Brown. I believe they posted that clip uh, this week on, I don't know if it was just on YouTube or like on social media, but they posted that clip and I had never seen it before. So that was interesting. But as Ed says, give me ABC. Okay. Maybe, maybe this one will be the one where we, we flip the script here, Astrid. I feel like yeah. our predictions, we always end up falling on the same page here. We have to flip some of this around. Uh, X Division Championship up next. Our, our number one fan, Trey, 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 <laughs> taking on the potential nine time, nine time, nine time. I'm not doing it nine times. Chris Saban. <laughs> I will run out of breath before my ninth time. Um, shoot, I don't want Trey to lose it, but I feel like having Saban as a champion will be interesting to see. And like him talking about like that uh, respect thing and like the defacing of the championship, we're get, you know, Saban here, we will get rid of that. So as much as I like Trey, as much as I like our champion and our favorite viewer and our favorite follower, I don't know what to call him at this point. Um, yeah, I will say it's Saban. So. Uh, I'm not I'm not going to pick against Trey Miguel. And I'm not going to forget his first or last name. He has two names. He is our champion. I'm saying that uh, Trey Miguel, our X Division champion, continues to reign, whether it's because Saban's tired from putting all of his effort in on speedball tonight uh, whether it's something where these two have another match down the line, I am saying that Trey Miguel is our winner. There you go. <laughs> uh, number one contenders match up next. Moose versus Eddie Edwards versus Jonathan Gresham versus Yu Yu Uemura versus Alex Shelley versus Frankie Kazarian. We have lots of options to choose from in this one. Lots of different pieces. Mm-hmm. I think we both kind of hinted the way we were leaning after last week's tag match. Are you feeling any different this week? How how do you think this one plays out? This one, I I keep thinking of like we have Macklin as the heel, so it feels like one of the faces should win this match. I'm um, just between being as a multi man, I kind of want to pick two people just in case. But um, I'm between um, Shelley and Gresham, and I feel like I would like to see something with Gresham because it feels like it's more like that baby face that would agree with Scott the more and be like the complete opposite of Macklin. So I feel like Gresham will be one I would like to see. I think I've had a change of face from last week. Um, I know I said that Alex Shelley taking the win last week, you know, re- reverse momentum theory suggests that maybe he doesn't actually end up winning the six man. Um, I think the story is just there for Alex Shelley as someone who's never won a world title. Mm-hmm feels like we're building to that we're playing to that i don't know that he's actually winning the title down the line from a macklin mm-hmm. i think um there's bigger things in in steve macklin's future than an alex shelley loss but i think the story is there that it would be a really really good build towards alex shelley and steve macklin i have to have to go with the machine gun there there you go Women's, aka knockouts, title match: Diana versus Jordan. If Jordan loses, she cannot get a match for the knockouts world title again, as long as Diana is champion. This one, I know we knocked on it earlier that the build for it hasn't really been fulfilling. They haven't really had the encounters, the interactions. It's it's been a mess. You've had a lot of different people playing parts to try and put some kind of story together between these two. I feel like it's a situation where we're just playing this out because Jordan needs to have that rematch because Jordan's been so strong and they Mm -hmm. don't have a better reason to put anybody else against Deanna. As long as Jordan's in the picture, I'm saying Deanna wins this match. 
whether clean or not, Jordan can't challenge for the title again. Takes Jordan out of the picture, allows Deanna to move on mm-hmm. to other people. Yeah, I feel like when we get 90% of these type of stipulations of like so-and-so wins and the other person can really challenge them as long as they're a champion, it makes me feel like 90% of the time becomes true. So that's why I think of like it has to be Deanna and that way we have Jordan move on to somebody else and perhaps we get Deanna versus Trinity next. But um, I definitely have to pick Deanna going forward. Perhaps we get Jordan versus Trinity next. Yeah, you never know. Never, never know. And finally, the world title, which was initially potentially Steve Macklin versus PCO. But before we get confirmation of that, we have Steve Macklin making his entrance to the ring to tell us that he is here to announce to us who his new number one contender will be. He's convinced that their attack on PCO last week has ended PCO, and so he needs a new challenger. And that person is the most promising up-and-comer in Impact Wrestling, a.k.a. Champagne Sing. Nice try. That's all I can say. Nice try. <laughs> Even when you told me, when I was like, do you have the graphic for it? And I said, no, you're very funny, though. Nice try. Not on my end. Sing couldn't even This talk. is what we're getting. This Sing is what we're getting. Sing couldn't even talk over the PCO <laughs> chance in Chicago. Mm-hmm. He's trying. He's trying to get out there. He's thanking Macklin for the opportunity and tries to talk about how his long and uh, winding road is culminating in this great mm-hmm. chance and he's going to make the most out of it. He unravels a long scroll of all the people he has to thank. Thank God for Scott Demore because he put a stop to this immediately. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even catch the first half of what Scott said. I just keyed in when he called him Dime Store Champagne Sing because <laughs> yeah. it was excellent. Um, Scott tells Macklin that you know he he needs to stop complaining, come down to the ring, fight, and prove why he's the best wrestler in the world. And fight everyone or anyone on any given night. Um, Macklin tells Demore that as long as he is champion, Scott's job title means nothing because Steve is his boss. And when he wins at Under Siege, Scott will come down to strap the title around his waist. Scott agrees to this, and Steve's like, But you haven't even told me who I'm facing tomorrow or who my new opponent is for tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. To which Scott finally ends the charade. Let's us know that's because there is no no new opponent for tomorrow night mm. because PCO will be there. Cue the lightning. PCO shows up, beats down Singh and Shira as Macklin tucks tail and runs up the ramp, and we finish with PCO standing tall in the ring with the championship. And as Barry says, Champion Singh sounded slightly English in his accent. I thought hmm. I didn't pick up on that. I guess, but yeah, Champagne um, Raj Singh. <laughs> Uh, nothing overall like this segment was funny to think about because I kept thinking, yeah, just I'm just waiting for PC to come out because I know that's what's happening in here. Um, but I like how we it goes back to what we have been saying for months when we thought of Steve Macklin versus Josh. You get thinking when Steve becomes champion, he's gonna become that person that Scott's gonna be like, I don't want you as champion. And then even going back and forth, like when he tells him, you know, when I win, I'm the boss. And the part of like him saying like you're gonna have me the championship when I win, like. It just so like the complete opposite of what Josh was as champion. So I think it's interesting to see like the two points here. Um, but yeah, other than that, I I I have Macklin winning. It. I I sorry if PCO. Yeah, I think that's the easiest match on the card right now. That mm. Macklin one hundred percent is winning this match. Um, PCO being his first feud is an interesting choice. I think it's a good way to show just what Macklin's capable of to you know beat down and slay the monster or at least keep the monster at bay um i did like the subtle little tease in this segment from scott though you know talking about how you talk about josh alexander and how macklin's Mm -hmm. the polar opposite and when macklin accuses scott of not wanting him to be champion and scott's like you want to know who i want to be champion the best wrestler on the planet Mm -hmm. which I think we're all on the same page that that falls under Josh Alexander in most cases um, without actually saying Josh's name. It was a nice little piece there from mm-hmm. Scott 
um, before he went into explaining, you know, Macklin can be that best wrestler on the planet if he actually just comes out and wrestles and doesn't try to, mm-hmm. you know, shenanigan his way out of matches backstage and politic his way around and that kind of stuff. It's for a match that we all know how it's going to end. I feel like it's been a quality build. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't feel like we have got really, a little bit of everything. Yeah. I that. don't feel like they've really fallen short in terms of the Macklin and PCO mm-hmm. build overall. I know we would have liked to have seen a little bit more as to how Macklin's relationship with Sing and Shira started, but mm-hmm. I think they course corrected and gave us at least a little bit of subtext in that as the yeah. story developed and went on. For a one-off feud that should end at Under Siege, I'm okay with the way this has went. I'm okay with it as it's been built, and I'm looking forward to, to what they do in the ring. Barry, when Scott threw his glasses away, I really wanted him to start renting at Shira by mistake. <laughs> um, and I feel like this, like the seven overall, was exactly how it should have been. The way of like Steve thinking, oh, because I'm champion, I'm gonna go my own way, and Scott being the boss, being you don't get to pick, you know, this way. It has to be the way I said it, and that's why we're sticking with PCO. And like I said, it just it gives you so many reasons as to why he's the opposite of Josh and why we are like. That why Scott loved Josh as a champion. And I feel like if we keep going in this sort of route, it just adds to that build up later when Josh returns of like, you're exactly what we don't want as champion in the company. You know, I'm the example. Look how I was as champion versus how you are as champion. And I feel like we already have a, a foundation there for their fear, their fear again when he comes back. Yeah. Depending how long he's out, if Macklin's still champion when Josh is ready to make his return, I think it's it's an easy feud to build to, and it would be mm-hmm. a hugely demanded match. I would love for them to be able to to get us to that point without it feeling like it's dragging too long. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, that's the show for tonight. We've got a loaded card for tomorrow night's Under Siege pay-per-view. Uh, we won't be live doing any kind of recap. We'll be back next week where we'll talk about what happened on tomorrow's Under Siege, as well as next week's impact from the fallout from Under Siege. Mm-hmm. Um as we are every Thursday and then Monday, you can catch the replay of, of today's predictions and everything and our recap from tonight's show. Uh, if, if you missed any of the show, it will be uploaded on Monday onto the backbreaker media channel as it is every Monday. If you ever miss our shows for me, Twitter right here, it's on the screen throughout the show at Cody Defoe. You can give me a follow, shoot me a message, tag me in anything. If you're watching Under Siege tomorrow night, hit me up, throw a comment my way of what you're liking, what you're watching, what you're thinking. Possibly include it in next week's show while I'm talking about it. Anybody that wants to, to give me some of your feedback on how you're feeling about the show, would love to hear from you while it's going on. Astrid, you're the busier one of the two of us. What have you got going on this week? Well, now that you ask, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I do have my interview for Astrid Ass, uh, episode 14 with Alyssa Marino uh, uh, going up uh, on the weekend after Night of Champions. Uh, be the, I believe I put it for 5 p.m. Uh, but before that, I'm going to put a clip to give you all a preview of what the interview will be like. Everything else has just been little opportunities that have, that have come my way. Uh, like we're for CCW, for Capital Championship mm-hmm. Wrestling, getting paired up with, uh, with Ella J. Like, that was such a, a fun experience that I never really thought that I would ever do, but it just kind of came about because we wanted to get to know more about the the talent on the roster. And, you know, I had never met Ella before, but we had this really great chemistry and it led to some really, really <laughs> awesome kind of uh, exploration of, of who these people are and getting to know them a little bit better. So things have just kind of like come in, in succession, yeah. but it all really started from just getting in the wrestling world uh, through the, the school, through Santino Brothers. Yeah, uh, so the interview will be live uh, Saturday at 5 p.m. Uh, for me, uh, aside from me watching it on their season, probably live tweeting as much as I can about it. Uh, tomorrow night after SmackDown, I'll be with Adam Parrish. Uh, we'll be doing a preview and predictions to Night of Champions. And I do have another Champions post show with a, a local establishment going on. Uh, I have a Battleground preview as well with Doc uh, Chris Miller from Bleacher Report. And I also have my Battleground post show because Ed will not be with me. So I had to bring the great Ella J to replace him for one night only. You heard that right at one night only. Uh, so uh, she does a post show with me to Battleground uh, for NXT. And my uh, NXT review does go up on the weekends of Women's Wrestling Talk, specifically on Sundays. 
And um, if anything, my Twitter will be there, which is Astro Pizarro. So yeah, uh, if anything, everything's there on my YouTube channel. You can just subscribe and hit the bell to get notified whenever I upload whatever is making an impact as we go live for an Astro Dads episode. Um, aside from that, I will also say as I will always uh, check out our local establishments because we we do a lot of work with them as well. So you never know what we have going on over there with them. Um, I know with the busy weekend, we they have a lot of content going up. Uh, they also have uh, coverage with Bobby and Lauren uh, for Double or Nothing as well. So we definitely have a lot going on. We, they have a Double or Nothing preview as well. So I would say check out our local establishments, especially on the YouTube side, if you can subscribe to them and then you'll see what we have going on when we go live with them. Um, but yeah, it'll be an exciting weekend uh, with all the wrestling that we have going on. Uh, so I'm just excited more than anything for how it'll be. Uh, as Corey says, great show again. Thanks for keeping me in the loop for Impact. As always, sir. Um, but no, I also wanted to double check in. Yeah, I have Miss Dickens that she's live. She's uh, playing. I forgot what it is. I Yeah, she's playing a video game. I, I don't have to see the title. But um, playing a video game, so I figured I'll give her a raid because she is uh, a great supporter as well. <laughs> so, so much coverage from Asher this weekend. Yeah, I will be a zombie by Monday. I'm glad I'm off from work. Uh, but yeah, I want to thank everybody for being in the comments with us tonight. Uh, more than anything, for your support. And if you enjoy the show, always tell a friend and, and subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can see more from us on Thursdays. And yeah, excited to see how Under Siege st starts You know, the weekend in wrestling for me. So that's what I'm looking forward to the most. Um, but yeah, thank you, everybody. And then we'll see you next time. Thank you.